Good morning. It is good to see all of you. That's good. Yeah, that's great. And uh, of course, that meant I had to shave this morning. <laughs> I want to welcome those of you who are watching by live stream as well. Thank you for doing that wherever you are. And we hope that you'll come and worship with us in person here soon at First Temple. I want to welcome those who are also joining us uh, down the hall in our overflow room where masks are required, where you feel a little bit more comfortable being still in an environment for your protection, wearing a mask. Thank you for coming this morning and joining us in that way. Well, as we are re-engaging with humanity, something kind of interesting is going on in our culture. We're all kind of uh, opening back up and getting back out and re-engaging with our friends and our neighbors and those with whom we share life in our community and something a little bit strange is going on. There's a vibe that's a little bit edgy and stressful and tense. Something interesting happened during the pandemic when we were shut down. Crime levels plummeted to an all-time low over the last hundred years. In that span of time when we were all closed up because of the pandemic, except for um, the crime of murder, it increased by 25% in 2020 all across the nation, not just in big cities, but everywhere. But since we've been reopening, since we've been reengaging with our fellow people, things aren't going as well. Crime, especially violent crime, is skyrocketing. And just in travel, as an example, there have been over 2,500 incidents reported to the FAA just in 2021 alone of unruly passengers in airports and on airplanes. And you may have heard recently about a flight attendant who had two teeth knocked out in an altercation with an airline passenger. Since January 1, there have been 394 four such violent assaults on airline personnel in airports on airplanes. It's not going very well, folks. We're not behaving ourselves very well. So we thought as a staff, it might be good for us to do a series these next few weeks called Good Neighboring and remind ourselves what Jesus taught us about being a good neighbor. So we're going to look at a foundational text this morning in Matthew chapter 22. If you want to begin to turn there with me, that'd be great. Either open up the church app or open up your copy of God's Word in Matthew 22. In the coming weeks, we're also going to look at 1 Corinthians 13 and really understand over a few weeks what real love looks like and what it means. And then we're going to look at the love chapters of 1 John chapters one, two, three, and four, and really understand again that when we love each other and when we love God, at best, all we're doing is say, God, we love you back because he loved us first. So this text in Matthew chapter 22, verse 34 through 40, I'm going to give you fair warning. You've seen it before. If you've been going to church any length of time at all, and many of you in this room in the classic venue have quite a bit of church, if we added up all the church tenure in here, one the, I have no idea. I don't think our calculators would have all that fit on the screen. I don't know about you watching online or down the hall how much church you've been in, but we've seen this passage before, and I want to give you fair warning that the reaction you and I might have is to yawn or roll our eyes. But I also want to remind you of this old adage that says this, with familiarity, it breeds contempt. So let's not write this off too much because after all, it was the teaching of our Savior, Jesus. Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. Now, of course, Jesus is teaching and ministering and there are religious leaders who are trying to trip him up, who are trying to trap him, who are trying to trick him, trying to get him to, to contradict himself because they don't like what he's teaching. They don't like how he's ministering. They are concerned about his claims to be the son of God, and they're really working hard to try to prove that he is not legitimate. He's not authentic. So they keep testing him with questions. And the Sadducees, a, a group of religious leaders, have just failed in doing so. The, so the Pharisees Tag team with them, and they pick up in verse 34. So when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together, 
One of them, a lawyer, ask him a question. Now, when you see the word lawyer, don't think of attorney like we have in our day, a litigator. Think of a research-based expert on the Judaic Mosaic law, understanding every T that is crossed, I that is dotted, and understanding the meaning of all those laws, what they do mean, what they don't mean. Asked Jesus a question to test him, the scripture says. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Some versions say, and strength, so added that. This is the great and foremost commandment. Then he adds a wrinkle. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and prophets. He added this wrinkle because the Sadducees and Pharisees were known for their self-proclaimed love of God, but the way they treated each other and those around them proved otherwise, contradictory in nature. What Jesus was saying to them and to us is, we cannot claim to be people of God on one hand and still act like we do coming out of a pandemic like we're doing right now. It doesn't work that way. To use the Texas term, it doesn't jihaw. There's no balance there. It is, in fact, the contradiction. They were trying to trip Jesus up, get him to contradict himself, yet they and their very lifestyles were contradicting themselves. And so do we. When we claim to love God, but treat each other like we do on a regular basis. Now, again, you may look at this text, and we're going to focus in as a as a foundational verse for our good neighboring series the next few weeks, this verse 39, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You may have heard that so many times that you want to roll your eyes or mute or check out. You've heard it. Can I suggest to you that even you long-time churchgoers have at least three things to discover in this text? Because I've discovered them recently myself. With new, fresh depth in these verses, I want to share with you today things I'm not sure you've ever seen before, so let's look closely. The second one, Jesus says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You shall love. You will do this. Isn't that what it sounds like he's saying? It sounds like he's making not just a command, but a demand, an insistence, and an imperative. You, like You and I have looked into our children's eyes before a time or two and go, you will do this. That's actually not what Jesus is doing at all. Now, it is the context of a command because he's answering what is the great command. But can I share something with you? He does not state this in an imperative voice in the language. He doesn't use a command. He uses a simple, future indicative, which just makes a prediction about the future. So what he's saying is, if you're my people, you will love the Lord your God with everything you got. And if you love the Lord your God with everything you got, you'll love yourself. And if you love yourself because you love the Lord with everything you got, you will, in fact, find yourselves loving your neighbor like yourself. It's the same structure he used in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, if you remember that one, where he is about to depart to go back into heaven. He's instructing his disciples about what's to do next, and he says, you're going to wait for the Holy Spirit to come on you, and when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will receive power. He's giving a prediction of what is going to happen in the future. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. He didn't say, you will be my witness. He says, it's a prediction. You will be my witnesses to the uttermost ends of the earth. I heard a preacher one time saying it this way. When I was growing up, I heard him say it, and it has stuck with me all these years. He said, folks, Jesus predicted we would be his witnesses. He didn't say we'd be good witnesses. He just said we'd be witnesses. Amen? Yeah, right. 
So, so Jesus isn't insisting here. He's not demanding that we do. You will do. No. He's describing the reality of the future when we live up to be the people of God. We claim we are. In, in, in fact, what he's doing here, he's not only just making a prediction, he's, he's stating an expectation for what his people will fulfill when we live like we're supposed to live. You, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you will love your neighbor as yourself. My, my question for you is, as we're reengaging humanity, as we're coming out of this pandemic, or you've already done that, or maybe you're about to really kind of open up and get back out there, whatever your plans are, my question is, how, 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 how are you doing with this prediction? How are you doing with this fulfilling of this expectation Jesus has for us as his people? Second thing I want you to see about this text I, I don't think you've seen before, and, and I'm going to tell you straight up honestly, I don't like this part of this. I, I just don't. Am I the only one that's ever read through the scriptures and go, oh man, I wish that wasn't in there? I, evidently, I'm not the only one. Yeah. This is one of those. But guess what? It, it, it's in there. All right? Let's look at it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That word love. Now, in our culture, and of course, we know that's an action, right? We know that this is a verb. He doesn't say you shall have love. You shall possess love. You shall feel love. That's not what he says. He says you will love. It's a verb. It's an action. It's something we do. In fact, sometimes it's something we do so that we might somehow figure out a way to feel that love for someone we're supposed to love, right? If we just act on it enough, maybe it'll kind of kick in a little bit, all right? Yeah, right? Amen? Are y'all judging me? Okay, all right. It's an action, of course. But, but I want you to see this. In our culture, we have one word, love, that means all the different kinds of loves we might experience. Whether it's a love for God or love for our spouse or love for family or love for our favorite sports team, go Red Sox, or our favorite food, barbecue. Or today, afterwards, it's hamburger and hot dog. I love hamburgers and hot dogs. We use love for all those different things. But in the culture and language of the time that Jesus was speaking here to this audience, they had four different words, distinct words, that meant different kinds of love. And here are the four. Affectionate love is storge, romantic love, eros, friendship love, philia, and selfless love, agape. That's God's love for us. And of course, here, he says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself is the agape love. It's the kind of love that God has for you and for me. Two characteristics of agape love that are very distinct very unique, that set it apart from the other three kinds of love. It is a fierce commitment to the good of another person, even at one's own expense. We're going to pursue the good of that other person, even if it means it's going to mean that we do without or we have to sacrifice, or it might even be painful for us to do it, but we're going to do it because that kind of love, it's the kind of God love that he had for us. The second characteristic is it is pursued with abandon regardless of whether that love is deserved or will be reciprocated. When I think about agape love, I think about God's love for us. I think about Romans chapter 5 verse 8 where Paul wrote, God demonstrates his own love, agape, toward us and that while we were still in the midst of sinning, Christ died for us. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul. We just sang that. That's the kind of love God has for us, and it's the kind of love he says his people will have for their neighbors, and that's the part I don't like. I so wish, I so wish he had used philia love, the brotherly, friendly love here. If he'd have picked that one instead of the agape, that'd be so much easier, the kind of you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours kind of love. 
the kind that is about reciprocation. It is kind of about, well, he hasn't loved me in a while, so I don't have to love, you know, that sort of thing. I wish he had used that one, but he did not. He, he <laughs> look this way. He did not use that love. He used the kind of love he has for us, knowing that he was going to go to the cross for your sins and for mine. He used agape love, that kind of love. There's something else about this, this word agape that we need to pay attention to. There's, a, there's a, a ring of hospitality, welcoming, receiving to it. In, in, in this culture in that day, and even to present day, known for their hospitality. If you've ever traveled to uh, the Middle East or to parts of the world that are Arabic in their culture, you know that they are the most hospitable culture in the world. They recognize strangers, and part of their whole culture system is to take in strangers and receive strangers and to serve strangers. And you can be a tourist in their country. They see that you need some help or some directions. They're going to actually not only reach out to give you directions, they're going to take you where they go. When you come to First Temple, we have trained our greeters and ushers to never point people to where they need to go, but to walk them. And I'll tell you, that's based upon an experience I had for the very first time in a Muslim Arabic country in North Africa. They don't give directions. They walk you where you need to go, even if it means it's hours out of their way to do that. And along the way, they're probably going to invite you to their home for a meal. And you have to really do some quick talking to get out of having to spend the night. I know, I've been there. Does that sound very much like our culture? No, 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 no. We don't even have people in our homes most of the time for dinner anymore. We, we'll meet them at a restaurant. We'll go Dutch. Or maybe they'll pick up the bill. You go, yeah, okay, yeah, you go ahead. I'll pick up the next one. Note to self, about six months from now, reach back out. <laughs> there, there's this ring of hospitality to this. Welcoming, receiving kind of love. That's the kind of love Jesus said we're to have for our neighbors if we belong to him. That, that's what we'll find ourselves doing. My question is, <laughs> are you like me? Do you wish it was one of the other kinds of love he'd picked out? Third thing I want you to see about this text, and, and, and you may have a general idea of this, but I, I really want to expand it a little bit more today, and that's the idea of who our neighbor is. Now, immediately we think of those we share a, a, a street with or a block with or a neighborhood with, and that's correct because literally the word for neighbor is a take on the idea of neighbor, those who are near. In fact, the word he uses here is a word that literally means near, something close by something right next to you. Often I'll say, turn to your neighbor and say this, and I mean the person next to you, right? So that's the idea. But, but we've got a problem in our culture. We don't even know who our neighbors are. In a, in a uh, Pew Data Research tells us that 42% of Americans said that their neighbors are mere acquaintances. That's all. Hey, how you doing? Great, brother, how are you? You say brother because you don't know his name. <laughs> You're a Christian, you forgot he might not be, so you say brother. Twenty-four percent of Americans admit that their neighbors are total strangers. But can I suggest to you it's not just those who are residing right next to us. Our neighbors, those who are near us, might be those with whom we cross paths throughout the day as we go out to work, as we go to school, as we shop, as we drive down West Adams and share lanes of traffic and pull up next to each other at the red light. Those are our neighbors. What about for us as a church, as a collective? Who's our neighbor? 
We're out here in West Adams now, new location seven years ago. Moved out here. Does that mean we're no longer downtown or with East Temple? Is it just the houses right around us? Well, quite honestly, it's all over the county because wherever you are, where your neighbors are, that's where our neighbors are as a church because it's where you are. And some of you live all across the county. Some of you are even coming from other counties. We have folks from other states who are watching us every week. I have a buddy in Fort Worth that watches us. Drew, how you doing, buddy? He's watching this morning probably. We're his church. Our neighbors are all over, everywhere we go. We have to think a little bit about it. I've got a buddy that sends me a note about, oh, four or five times a year, a little encouraging note. And every time, he's not a member here, but, but every time he writes me this note, he always addresses it, Joe Lachlan, pastor, First Baptist Church of Central Texas, is what he says. He gets it. He understands this idea that our neighbors are wherever we are. Those are our neighbors. So I want you to think about that. Do you know who your neighbors are? And answer this question. How are you doing in fulfilling this prediction, this expectation that Jesus has for his people, that we would love agape love, selfless love, even to the extent of expense love, even if it's not deserved love, even without a hint of an issue about whether or not it's going to be repaid or not kind of love? With those with whom we are sharing the highways and the byways of life, our neighbors. We thought it might be time for us as a church to think about and practice good neighboring this summer as we engage. Maybe you need to start with a refresher about how God loves you. A selfless, welcoming, receiving, non-binding love. What I mean by that is, is that Jesus was willing to die knowing that the vast majority of humans for whom he died would reject his offer of forgiveness and what he did for them on the cross. But he did it anyway. That kind of love. Non-binding, without hope of reciprocity. Start with a refresher on how God loves you. As you're doing that, pay attention to see if maybe God is bringing some of the same people again and again and again across your path. Are you noticing those faces? Now that we're removing our masks, that you realize, you know what? I've seen that guy at that store three times in the last three weeks. Maybe this week when it happens again, you walk up and introduce yourself. Now, you got to be careful. You can kind of freak some people out. You know, one of the things I'm doing right now is I'm learning my neighbor's names. We've been in our home four years, and I don't know all my neighbor's names, and I'm trying to learn their names, and I... I'm trying to be careful. I'm kind of looking on Facebook and I look on bellcad.org to see who's got tax appraisal, you know, seeing whose neighbors are. About their neighbors. You got to be careful with that because if you're walking down the street and they say, hey, how you doing? Hey, Jim, hi, Susan, how you doing? I mean, they, and then they find out what you do for a living. They go in the house, lock the door, turn out the lights, pull the shades. I mean, you know, they, preachers own us, baby, preachers own us. <laughs> He's going to invite us to church. I know he is. But are you seeing some of the same people over and over and over again that you don't know? Maybe you would stop and say, hey, let me introduce myself to you. I, I don't know if you've noticed, but I've noticed we've been crossing paths a lot lately. It's happened to me. About the last three or four weeks, every morning as I go to leave our neighborhood to come to the church, there's a couple that's walking together. Now, they're, they're, they're not part of our little neighborhood. They're, they're walking down the road outside our neighborhood. And I don't know if they are leaving their home and on their way out or if they've been walking and they're on the road. I'm not sure. I have no idea. 
But the first morning I met them, by view, I almost ran over them because they were jaywalking. And so I didn't see them in time, almost. And then, and then we waved at each other. And then the next morning we saw each other in time and we waved. It was a little more of a casual, friendly wave that time. <laughs> and then every morning now for about three weeks, I see them or they see me first. And whichever one sees the other one first starts waving and the other one waves back. And this is the week it's going to happen. This week, I'm giving you my word to challenge you to do the same sort of thing. This week, I'm pulling my truck over, and I'm going to introduce myself. Hopefully, right off the bat, they won't ask me what I do for a living. (laughs) Because it can shut a party down, I'll tell you that. Are you noticing the same faces? Maybe. You take whatever level of hospitality you're currently practicing and you take it up a notch. Maybe, maybe you're not yet ready to have people come in your home, but you might say, hey, let's go grab a meal sometime. Let's go grab a cup of coffee. Or maybe you're out walking like I do and you're, you know, you're working on your exercise, so you've got that time going, and you got the heart rate up and everything, and then you start talking to a neighbor, and maybe you just go ahead and hit the pause, and you stop, and you spend some time talking with them. It's a little bit of your expense of your time and your exercise, but it's okay because you're, you're getting to know them a little bit, and you're, and, you're, and you're learning their name. I got a couple that I met this last week, uh, on a walk where I just stopped and said, hey, how you doing? And they started talking. Next thing I know, it was 20 minutes. And they did most of the talking. And I'm the preacher. They did most of the talking. But I, I, I won't tell you their names because they may be watching. I have no idea. But they're, they're A and J are, are their initials. And I got to know them a little bit. And I'm praying for them. And I have no idea where they are with Jesus. But that's okay. That's, I love them. I love them. Maybe take it up a notch. Maybe you're ready to have someone in your home. We have a couple in the church that they told us just recently, um, this is Hannah and Jesse, they told us just recently about this idea of good neighboring and inviting people to church and all that. that they, they have a policy as a couple. They're, they're fairly newly married. They married in the last year. They have, a, they have a policy as a couple that they won't invite anybody to church until and after they've actually added, invited that person or couple over to their home for a meal first. And that's hospitality right there, see. As we we re-engage with our fellow human beings, I would say that there's plenty of room for there to be some balance with some love. Jesus said, if you're my people, you'll love God with all thing you got. And you'll love your neighbor as yourself. Would you pray with me? Would you take 60 seconds to quietly sit still and listen for the voice of the Spirit of God to speak to you about what he might want you to take out the doors from this message today?